Welcome, River West Church. It is so good to be with you. My name is Nicole Rawlings, and I have been for the past eight years one of our children's ministry coordinators, and it is a joy to work with you um, and your children as we partner together uh, to raise the next generation of Christ followers. I'm so happy to be with you today. I miss your faces so much, and we are just so excited today for what the Lord has for us. I hope that you um, just tune in, open your hearts to what Adam has to say to us today. And kids, if you're there, I'm just sending you all the hugs. I miss you so much. I hope you're doing well. And I'm going to come back in a little bit and I'm going to tell you about some really exciting new things that we have on the horizon when it comes to our family life ministry. So I hope you will stick around. I can't wait to talk to you again. Okay. Well, good morning, River West. Thank you again for tuning in. Thanks, Nicole, for leading us into this space, this time of worship. And we're just so glad that you have uh, set aside this time to meet with the Lord in community, in your homes. And I believe that God is here, that he's here with us now, that he's here with you and that he's moving and he's working. And we're gonna sing about that in just a moment, but right now I wanna read from Hebrews chapter one just to lead us in. So let's receive these words. Maybe you wanna close your eyes and and just let God's word wash over you today if you feel comfortable closing your eyes. Just wanna encourage you to do that. Let me read this. Hebrews one, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for his sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And what I want us to hear from God's word today is that he has spoken and he has revealed himself through his son and he is still speaking to us today through his word. And that brings us comfort and hope as we enter this time of worship today. He's speaking to you right now. And let's believe that as we begin singing this song about God's presence in this world and in our lives right now. Let's sing. You are here. You're moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you You are here You're working in this place I worship you I worship you Sing that again You are here You're moving in our midst I worship you I worship you. You are here. You're working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Sing this. Because you are we make miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness. My God. That is who you are. Cause you are we make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, you are here, you touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You're healing. You are here. You're healing every. 
every heart I worship you I worship you You are here Oh, you turn the lives around I worship you I worship you You are here Mending every heart I worship you I worship you Cause you are way maker Miracle work Promise keep Light in the darkness My God That is who you are Cause you are way maker Miracle work Promise keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. That is who. Oh, that is who you are. And that is who you are. Oh, that is who you are. And that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, declare that never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. You always make miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Cause you are way making miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who, oh, that is who you are. Oh, that is who you are. That is who you are, and that is who you are. Oh, that is who you are, and that is who you are. Oh, that is who you are, and that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are, and that is who you are, and that is who you are. Oh, that is who you are, and that is who you are, and that is who you you Lord oh your mercy never fails me all my days I've been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able 
I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God For all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so, so good in every breath I will see the goodness of God all my life. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. It's running after, it's running after me. Cause all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able. I will sing the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness. Your goodness is running out. It's running out to me. Your goodness is running out. It's running out to me. My life laid down, I surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so. So good Every breath that I am able I will sing The goodness of God I will sing Of the goodness of God I will sing The goodness Wow, what a great time of worship. Thank you, Colin. Um, I am so excited to let you know that at the beginning of September, we are launching a brand new family-friendly service for all of our River West families and kiddos. So this is what you can expect. Saturday, September 5th, maybe Saturday, September 6th, we haven't decided yet, you will be able to tune in to a brand new service where we will offer live teaching, uh, worship, crafts, activities, memory verses, and some other exciting things that I think you might find amusing. 
So whether you take your whole family, sit down on Sunday afternoon and watch it together and interact together with all of the things that we're doing, producing, or you maybe just have your oldest press play so that you can have a little bit of downtime to watch the Sunday sermon and worship with uh, your spouse, please use this as a resource. We wanna partner with you as you raise your children um, to know the Lord. And we are really hoping that that is what this is going to do for you. And now uh, let's grab our Bibles and join Adam as he uh, gives us the message for today in Ephesians. All right, church, great to be with you this morning, worshiping together. And of course, we're also super excited about this evening, the outdoor drive-in worship services we'll be having, 7 p.m., 8 p.m., right in the church parking lot. And uh, just a quick word to you extroverts and huggers out there. I know who you are, I, and I know what you're going to be tempted to do when you get in that parking lot. You're going to try to jump out of those cars and run around and start hugging everybody. We are asking that you stay in your cars for this one. We're already sort of pushing the limits with city ordinances, et cetera. And so asking that you stay in your car. If, once you're inside your car, you can, you can hang out the window. You can pop open the tailgate. You can stand on your seats out your sunroof like an 80s rom-com. We don't care just as long as you're in your car. It's going to be a wonderful time together. Please join us. That 7 p.m. service will be a lot of our younger families. And so maybe if you're if if you uh, don't have younger children, you could come to that 8 p.m. service. And when you get there, just tune your radio to 90.1 and you'll be able to hear the whole worship service on your radio. It's gonna be wonderful. But right now I'm excited to get into the scriptures. Grab your Bible, open with me with, to the book of Ephesians chapter four. We're gonna start there and then we're gonna go to John 17 and then we're gonna go to Philippians four and we've got a wonderful time together planned here. This new series we've titled, I Will Build My Church. And if you were with us last week, we learned that the very same Jesus who spoke those profound words over 2,000 years ago, he is the risen and reigning Lord, seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling over the cosmos and River West. He's speaking those words right now over our church, over our community, over our world. I will build my church. And so we talked about last week, we're not just, we're not just getting encouragement uh, from that, but we're getting a renewed vision. We're getting back inside of the mind of the architect so that we could reimagine with Christ what he had in mind when he spoke those words. And here's what I want you to know. As I, as I prayed about where to go in this you know, first sermon after the intro sermon, so today's message, I really prayed about this. I really thought about this. And I knew pretty early on, I've got to talk about unity. Unity is the theme today for a couple of reasons, okay? First of all, a strong biblical case can be made that this is one of the first and primary traits that Jesus had in mind when he said, I will build my church. This is what he wanted his people to think of primarily. And this is what he wanted outsiders to experience when they would encounter the church, unity. And I plan to make that case biblically for you this morning. But the second reason I really need to speak to unity is I, I, I feel like I need to speak some things into our cultural moment. And the way that I would describe our cultural moment right now is fractured. Our world is so fractured. Our country is so fractured and divided. And sadly, the church often looks like the world when it comes to the things that we divide over. And so it's important for us to talk a little bit about unity, Christ's vision for unity. Last month, I read um, an article that was, it got a lot of views. It was written by a blogger that I follow. And the article was called, Church, Don't Let Coronavirus Divide You. And here was sort of the image that, that went with that article. And, and the purpose of this article was to encourage pastors and church leaders 
uh, on how to navigate such a moment that's fraught with so many things that Christians can divide over. How can we preserve our unity in the church when there's so much to potentially disagree about right now in our world? And we can. And here's what I want to say to you right out of the gate, brothers and sisters, hear me when I say this. Disagreement and division are not the same thing. And the latter does not have to be the result of the former. Disagreement, even in the church, does not have to lead to division. In fact, I'd like to propose that there's a way for us in the church to disagree about things, and we will. That's part of being in community. There's a way to disagree about things that actually shines a spotlight on our unity. And I'm going to call our church to that this morning. So let's lay a biblical foundation for that. We open now to Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. Here's what Paul said. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And now what's so interesting, and I'm going to keep reading in just a moment, but this is actually the first point in the book of Ephesians where Paul gives a command. His very first exhortation comes in chapter four, verse one. So chapters one through three, it's all indicatives. There's no commands. There's no imperatives. It's all truth statements about the church, about the gospel, about the glory of Christ, about what Jesus is building. Paul just keeps saying, this is true, this is true. And then suddenly he gets to chapter four, verse one, and scholars call it a hinge verse where Paul pivots and he says, therefore, in light of all of that, and he gives his very first command. And what is the very first thing that Paul talks about? He, he urges the church to, in light of all of that truth, he says, the first thing we got to talk about is unity. This is astounding. He says, he says, be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Are you getting the emphasis there? Unity, unity. Paul says one, 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 one Lord, one God, one spirit, one faith, one hope, unity. The first quality of a church that's operating in the world in a manner worthy of the high calling of God, the very first quality is unity. It's priority number one in the mind of the architect, the one who said, I will build my church. One of the first traits that he wants his people to care about is unity. And for Paul, this was a matter of utmost urgency. Did you see there in verse three, he said, you gotta be eager for this church. Think of the things that you and I are eager for. You could make a list of all the things you're eager for. And the question would be, is, is unity in the body of Christ? Does it even make it on the list? Let alone, is it near the top of the list of things we're eager for? So I wanna talk about this this morning. And here's two things that I'm gonna draw out. I'm gonna call these two critical insights. If you miss these, you'll miss the whole point of the passage, okay? Insight number one, write this down, think about it, pray about it this week. Simple, unity is a miracle. It's a miracle. Because Paul calls it a unity of the spirit. Did you see that? He says, maintain the unity of, of the spirit, which means the unity that Paul's describing here is not something that can be caused or explained by something natural, something from this world. It's otherworldly. It's supernatural. It's a miracle. It's certainly not something we can create. It's the kind of unity that when people see it or experience it or enter into a church where it's happened, they think what's going on here, the only thing that ex can explain this is that a gospel bomb has gone off in these people's hearts. 
and their lives. Within the last five years, um, many books have impacted me, but there's one book in particular, that for some reason, it just rattled me. I kept going back and reading it again and again. It was called Compelling Community. Uh, the author is Jamie Dunlop. And in this book, he has a chapter and it was the chapter of this title that just, just rattled me. It stopped me in my tracks. And the title of the chapter was How to Build Church Community Without the Gospel. You heard me right. Not with the God. He, he titled it How to Build Church Community Without the Gospel. And I remember reading that and going, what? And, and his point was not to recommend this. His point was to say, this happens. This does, it's possible. He writes, many relationships that naturally form in our churches would exist even if the gospel weren't true. That's not necessarily a negative thing, Jamie argues. It's actually just reality. It's human nature. We naturally are human beings who are gonna to gravitate towards people who, who we share common things with, people who we feel aligned with, people who share our, our interests or our hobbies or even our views and opinions, people who are in a common life stage. If there was a, a small group in our church that was for people who loved German soccer, I would be there in a moment. It would be me and one other weirdo, all right? That's just, it's human nature. But, but Jamie says, but that's a problem. He goes on and he says, so, so, so if, if we just stop there, that's a problem. What we need to do is additionally, he writes, we should aspire for many relationships that exist only because of the gospel. And Jamie calls this gospel revealing community. I love this, gospel revealing community. He writes, in gospel revealing community, many relationships would never exist but for the truth and power of the gospel. Either because of the depth of the care for each other or because the two people in the relationship have little in common but Christ. It's a miracle. That's the whole point. This kind of unity and community is a miracle. This is the only thing that could possibly explain the connection between these people is what Paul says, one Lord, one Father, one hope, one baptism. It's the gospel that draws people together. And this kind of community is so obviously supernatural that it makes the gospel visible to the world. It's a kind of community that requires the gospel as its only explanation. And here's the thing, we know that this was priority number one for Jesus because we know that he prayed for this in his very, one of his very last prayers before he went to the cross. His very last prayer to his father, he prayed for this kind of unity. I've been reading this, this prayer a lot over the last couple of months and it just strikes me. You know it, John 17, Jesus had prayed, Father, he said, keep them in your name, which you have given me, listen to this, that they may be one, even as we are one. And remember, this is, this is Jesus. This is, the, this is the, the lamb and the lion who's worthy to open the scrolls of human history. This is the, the son of man who comes on the clouds. This is the Jesus who said, I will build my church. And now here he is, he's praying his very last prayer to his father. And what does he pray for? I pray that, that my people would be one, just as you and I are one. He said, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one, even as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Here, here's Jesus. He's praying. And he says, here's my prayer. Father, I pray that that the church would be one, perfectly one, just like you and I are one. This is a, it's a miracle. That's the whole point. It's exactly what Paul said. You notice in that, in, back in Ephesians 4, Paul, that list of ones, 
the Trinity is in there. There's other things like hope and baptism and faith, but all of those are, are things that connect us into the triune God. Have you ever thought about that? One spirit, one Lord, one father. God exists in perfect, eternal unity. And then Jesus has the audacity to pray for a miracle. And to say, this is my greatest desire. This is my prayer that my church would be that perfectly one, just like that, astounding. And then he goes on to say, and there's a purpose to that. The purpose is that the world would know that you sent me. That's the purpose of the unity. And I, I, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I read that. And the first thing I think is, it's hard to believe that that's going to work. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of things that I would suggest that we do to convince the world that Jesus is real, but this was, would not be one of them, you know? Unbelievable. I mean, there's a lot of things in the Bible that I, I would do differently than, than, than God does. You know, circumcision is one of them. But, but I, you, you read this and you think, is this really gonna work? And, but think about this, River West. Is this strategy on your list of evangelism strategies. <laughs> so we have this set of expectations, like this will work. We gotta, we gotta really study up on apologetics. We gotta be able to win arguments. And we have a whole list of things that are all really probably great and helpful. But how many of us have on our list at place number one, our unity as a church? And I think the reason Jesus knew this would, this would convince the world is because it's a miracle. A world that's fractured and fragmented and dividing at an ever increasing pace would, would look into the church and go, what is going on there? This is astounding. Unity's a miracle. That's, that's the first kind of critical observation, but here's the second. So the, the, the unity is a miracle, but number two, the miracle needs to be maintained. We can't create the miracle. It's, it's, it is a miracle, but we have a role to play. And our role is to maintain it, to nurture it, to preserve it. Did you see that verse three? Paul says, be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit. And you say, well, how do we do that? Well, that's verse two. Did you see it? These, this list of words, verse two? He says, with all humility and gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. You say, how do I, how do I be a person who works to maintain unity in my church? Paul would say, here's a list of traits. Here's a list of activities. Here's a, a list of virtues to cultivate. And we just look over that list for me, just hover over it. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, and love. This tells me Paul's realist. He gets it. He realizes maintaining unity is hard. It's really difficult. It's not easy. Look what he doesn't have on his list. He doesn't say maintain unity with laughter and hugs and happiness. No, Paul realizes this is this is going to require some hard work. You're going to have to bear with one another. You're going to have to put up with one another. That's what patience and forbearance means. I mean, you actually have to tolerate people in community. I'm so glad those words are in this list because that means there's room for me in community because people have to put up with a lot <laughs> to be in community with me, right? Perfect people don't have to be put up with. They don't have to be tolerated. No patience required. But for the rest of us, we have to forbear with one another in love and patience and humility. Look at that list. It could be broken into two groups. The first two words go together, humility and gentleness. These are inward traits. You got to carry these with you into community. You can't always assert yourself in community. You, you, you can't always get your way. Your agenda doesn't always get to be top of the list. Sometimes you have to be humble. Sometimes you have to be willing to repent. Have you ever noticed how in our society today, how confident we are 
or how confident, easily confident we can become that our, my view is the only right view and everyone else's view is the wrong view. Isn't that interesting? I think there's reasons for that. Part of it is we have access to constant influx of information. So if we're, if we're home a lot, we have a lot of time on our hands and we're on the internet, we're naturally gonna go to sites and resources that are gonna reinforce what we already wanna believe about something. And so we can become rigid and even arrogant sometimes in our views. And then what happens is you go into community and you know what happens in community? What happens in community is you, you, you get into a house church or a community group with people who love Jesus and, and you're united in Christ and you start expressing opinions about a view and, and you discover, whoa, wait a minute. There are people in this room who have a different view than me and they love Jesus and they love me and they love my church. And, and I'm coming to the realization we have a different view on this and that's actually a really good thing. And that brings us to the second three traits. They go together. Look at them. Patience, forbearance, and love. Think of these as the outward trait. These are the traits you express. It's like your disposition towards people in community. You got to have other people around to practice patience. You have to actually have to be in community. River West, if you never have to endure someone, if you never have to be patient in love and forbearance with someone, and if someone never has to endure you, it probably means you're not very deep in community. I used to beat myself up when I would blow it in, in community. I'd do something arrogant or prideful or I'd blow it and, and I'd feel really bad about it. And now I actually realize I've given you an opportunity to practice forbearance, okay? <laughs> so that's what we have to do in community. We gotta practice this. It takes patience and love. That's the whole point. We're not going to always agree on everything. Sometimes we have to walk with humility to experience and maintain that miracle that Jesus creates in his church. I love this. I was thinking this week, have you ever noticed that um, Paul in his letters, there are moments where um, he'll get to a point in his letter where he addresses a specific issue that a church is actually dealing with. And sometimes these, and these moments can be awkward. He'll actually name names. He'll actually maybe address individual people and call them out by name. It happens in Philippians. Do you remember this? Don't turn there, uh, but this is Philippians 4 verse 2. It's, it's here on the screen. This is where Paul near the end of the letter says, I entreat Euodia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Or he, he could have borrowed from his language in Ephesians. He could have said, I, I entreat them to maintain the unity. Yes, I ask you also, true command, companion, which was someone else that he was writing to, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So Paul gets to this point in the letter where, where he's actually got to talk to some people and he, and he says, I entreat you, maintain unity, agree in the Lord. And what's so profound about this moment and how it fits with what we're talking about this morning is, first of all, these were deeply mature gospel warriors who were having some kind of a major disagreement. I mean, major enough that Paul, who's writing from prison, takes precious time and ink to talk about it. These were mature Christians. Their names were written in the book of life. They had labored with Paul in the gospel, and yet they disagreed about something. That happens. It happens to me all the time. In, in, in the, my closest relationships in the church, I'll come to a realization, whoa, with this person that I love and adore and we're deeply unified, and yet we're having a major disagreement about something that feels really important to me. And I know you experienced that too. Now here's the next thing to notice. Whatever the disagreement was about, it apparently was not a core gospel issue because whenever Paul had one of those, he would, he would address it. But in this situation, 
Paul doesn't necessarily know who's right or wrong in this. And he doesn't speak to the issue itself, which means it was, it was something other than a core gospel issue. And yet it was big enough that they had a major disagreement. And you say, wait a minute. That means that it's possible in the church to be totally united in Christ and yet have a major disagreement with someone about something. That happens in the church. And that means that disagreement and division are not necessarily the same thing, River West. They don't have to be one and the same. And the latter does not have to be the result of the former. Disagreement does not have to result in division. Consider the following categories. We use these a lot in our church. So we've talked about how uh, in our church, we, we, we take different issues and we put them under different headings. Here's three to think about. And this is just three. There's other ways that we could do this, but consider these categories. Divide over, debate over, and discuss over. And under each of those headings, you could place certain issues. There are things that at River West, we would divide over issues that are so core, so central to what we believe that if a person had a major problem with these issues, they might not have, they might, they, they might not be happy at River West. It might be better for them to worship somewhere else. But these would be very core issues. The, the idea that God exists in, in, in a triune nature, the Trinity is, is, a, is a divide over issue the deity of Christ, the trustworthiness of scripture, the atonement that Jesus died for our sins and by his blood, our sins are forgiven. If you have problems with those, you're not gonna sit through a worship service and not be agitated, (laughs) okay? But then there's other issues that we can debate over. And that list is really long, but that doesn't mean those issues aren't important to us. In that list, you could have issues like the Calvinism-Arminianism debate. At our church, we have people all over the spectrum on that, on that topic. Or political views, or political parties, or how you think you should vote. River West, there are a lot of things in that debate category that we can debate over and even disagree about. But here's the thing. We can do it in a way that actually cultivates our unity in Christ. Incredible. And then of course, there's a discuss over categories and that would even be lower level. That'd be like age of the earth or your views on the eschaton, the tribulation, are you post-mill, pre-mill, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that go in there that are low level discussions. But see, I wanna argue that there's a way in the body of Christ to disagree, to debate, to discuss. We could even debate which issue should go in the divide over category. Great, let's do that. But let's do it in a way that demonstrates to the world our unity in Christ. It's a high calling for sure. This is why Jesus prayed for it. And we stand on his power to fulfill that miracle of unity. But here's what we don't do. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna close here, but I am gonna speak directly to some things. We're never gonna maintain unity by avoiding really important topics. So the, the, the way to maintain unity is not to avoid things that matter. I've heard people say, maybe we should not preach about controversial issues. Let's not talk about political issues, just preach the gospel, okay? That has worked in River West for decades and decades. Like, like just stick to the gospel. And, and I hear people say that. And what I, what I wanna do is I, I, wanna, I wanna respond to that idea with just a couple thoughts. The first thing that I wanna say to that is there's a problem with that. And the problem is that the New Testament constantly applies the truth of the gospel to political issues, like all the time. You can't read um, a Pauline letter and not 
see Paul take the truth of the gospel and then say, here's how this works out in critical issues like the sanctity of life, human sexuality, the meaning of marriage, how to relate to civil authorities, ethnic diversity and the tension and the hurt that can come from that, even in the church. You can't read one of Paul's letters and not see Paul take the gospel, the truth of the gospel and apply it to ethnic or racial tension. He does it in almost every one of his letters. You can't read the New Testament and not see Paul talk about justice, Jesus and his heart for justice. And so we, we kind of need to scratch that statement from our vernacular. We should not be saying avoid politics or contentious stuff, just preach the gospel because that's not, that's, you can't do that and preach the Bible. But here's kind of where I want to end. The, the, the next statement that I'll say about that is why, just think about this with me for just a minute, okay? Why would we allow a political issue to divide us? unless that is the foundation of our unity in the first place. You see what I'm getting at there? Why, why, would, we allow a, why would we allow a secondary political issue to divide us? That would demonstrate that our unity was built on that issue. Or let me say it differently. Why would we allow something to divide us that was never the cause of our unity in the first place? I mean, I could understand why the world is going to divide over all these issues, but why would that happen in the church where we've just learned unity is a miracle that God creates by uniting us in the gospel of Christ? So, so why wouldn't we be able to talk about other issues and not have it divide us? We should be. If, we, if, we're, if we're not able to talk about these incredibly important issues, what we would be demonstrating is that it's not actually Jesus that has brought us together. And that concerns me because I need to be able to open the Bible with our church and say, let's talk about fill in the blank. Let's talk about some things that are political. Let's talk about ethnic diversity in the church, in our country. Let's talk about the hurt around that. We need to talk about that if we're gonna do a series on I will build my church. Jesus had a lot of these issues in his mind. Last month, I'll just illustrate with something light. My family got into a pretty contentious debate, okay? It was about our pets. And we have too many pets. We have four of them. And I was making the case that our newest dog, Winnie, is by far the most annoying animal that I've ever met in my life. I mean, I would argue this dog is actually possessed by a demon. Okay, she's that annoying. And, and of course, my family was not happy with me saying all this. And so we got into this debate where each member of our family, this is going to sound weird, each member of our family ranked our animals from least annoying to most annoying. <laughs> or, or most favorite, our most favorite animal to our least favorite animal Parents, I don't recommend you doing this about your children, but with your pets, maybe it's okay. So we got into this thing. And then what we did is we turned it around and we said, let's imagine we're the animals. How would the animals rank the humans? And we had this big debate conversation. It got heated, but at, at never at one point did I think, hey, we shouldn't talk about this. This is gonna divide our family. It never dawned on me. And you know Why? because I know that my family is not united around that issue. And I've had conversations with many of you about really big contentious issues where I discover we don't see totally eye to eye on this. And it has never dawned on me in one of those conversations that it would divide fellowship. And it's because I believe that the, the miracle that's holding us together is our shared faith in Jesus Christ and his gospel. So let's talk. Let's, let's debate. Let's love one another. Let's lean into important things. Brothers and sisters, we are living in an age where the world needs the truth of the gospel to bring healing and justice and progress in a lot of different things. And that means that the church needs to be able to lovingly talk about those things in a way that shines light 
on our unity in Christ. And that means we're going to have to do it with humility and gentleness, patience, forbearance. It means we're going to have to listen to James when he says, remember what James said? He said, be slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to anger. How often do we get those flipped, (laughs) right? We're quick to speak, slow to listen, quick to anger. James says, you got to flip that around if you're going to talk about important things. Or Paul in Philippians, when he said, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Don't just look to your own interests, but the interests of others. To listen well with humility, to love, to be patient, gentle, lean in, celebrate our unity in Christ. When Jesus said, I will build my church, that's what he had in mind. And I, for one, want to be a part of maintaining it. And so I'd love for you to pray with me about that. Jesus, how we thank you for your word, how we thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit inspiring your servant, Paul, to write this beautiful text, how we celebrate together as a church the miracle of unity in Christ and how we pray for your power and your wisdom, the grace of your Holy Spirit to maintain it well, even in these fractured days we pray that River West would shine the beacon of the light of the gospel. And it's in Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Sing Father in heaven. Father in heaven, we are your children. You gave us life, O oh Lord, life eternal. And you hold nothing back from those you love. Our Father in heaven, we are your children. We sing, and we sing as one, Lord. We are your children. Pour out your Spirit upon the broken. our hearts we trust you completely yes you do you lay out our path and keep us close cause you are first and the last oh lord and you know us deeply we sing we sing as one, Lord, cause we are your children, pour out your spirit upon the broken, oh loving Father, come and draw me.
Father, you're holy. Keep singing that. You are holy. Once more, Father. Father, you're holy. Yes, you are. Lord, you are. We sing this one, Lord. We are your children. Pour out your spirit upon the broken. Now once more we sing, and we sing as one, Lord. We are your children. Pour out your Spirit upon the broken
All right, church, great time of worship this morning. And we've come to that place in our service where I'd like us to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Now, many of you are in house church settings and you've got that liturgy guide right there. So if you're in community or with family or in a house church, you can hit pause and open that liturgy guide. Any of you, by the way, can use that liturgy guide. There's some beautiful prayers in there that Derek has written. But if you find yourself alone this morning, I'd like to lead us in the eating and the drinking of the Lord's Supper and just remind you that unity is deeply connected to this moment. There's a a place in 1 Corinthians where Paul says, make sure that you, you don't eat and drink in an unworthy or an unhealthy manner. And he had in mind divisions and factions in the church. So he, just, he, he, he reminded the church, this moment is a family meal. And so if you're divided or if you've, if you've been, you know, if you've created factions in the church, you need to go and make amends. But we, so we recognize that we're eating and drinking of, of, the, of the fellowship that we have in Christ together. On the night that Jesus was to be crucified, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said every time you eat of this remember my sacrifice for you so let's take and eat this morning and in the very same way taking the cup and pouring it out Jesus said this is the new covenant in my blood Every time you drink of this, remember, let's drink together. Amen, church. God bless you today. We'll see you next Sunday.